Once a critical mass of Africans had found a way to learn how to read their Bibles in this country, they discovered why it had been hidden from them. They discovered that it contained a subversive message against spiritual and physical enslavement and for liberation and freedom and healing. And they started to move out of the segregated balconies of the white churches, among them Episcopal churches, and start their own churches, churches that centered them, churches that were grounded in their own experience. Theologian James Cone writes about how these churches evolved, noting that their services were long, really long by our standards. People would get dressed up in their very finest clothes. Their leaders would be given exalted titles, titles that showed that in this house they mattered. They had status. Their worship was expressive and joyful, even ecstatic, a whole body experience. It transported them to another place. And it was followed by sharing of food and fellowship that lasted for hours. For those hours each Sunday, they transcended the world. Their only master was the Lord God. The black church was and is truly a house of love. All of this was happening in times of great stress and distress for black Americans, enslaved or otherwise. They were living amidst the ominous signs and portents of which our gospel speaks. Fearful times. The nation committed to institutional slavery was a pariah in the world. Internally, it was torn asunder. The world around them was full of violence, lynchings, huntings, and legal killings of the enslaved and their protectors. A time of oppressive and dehumanizing laws that justified literally any pain or suffering an enslaver inflicted on what was his property. These were the signs of the times in which, nevertheless, this church emerged as a house of love. Imagine a preacher in that church speaking to the readings we heard today. People, get ready. For the days are surely coming when a righteous branch will spring up and execute justice and righteousness in this land. When amidst distress among nations, roaring seas and waves and fear and foreboding, the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and the Son of Man will come in a cloud to be that instrument of justice and righteousness. So get ready. There's a train coming. We need to get on board. Now, at the time Jesus said these words of signs and portents, he was on his way to the cross. It's easy then to imagine the disciples already anxious and uncertain, being fearful when they heard them. It's easy to hear them as bad news, even a coming Armageddon. Likewise, we ourselves might hear them as warnings to take cover, to batten down the hatches, to put on the armor of Tevlar, not light, the armor and armaments of war. After all, don't we see distress among and within nations? Aren't we confused by drought and fires and hurricanes and floods that make the seas and waves roar? Aren't we seeing, in this time of global pandemic, people fainting, their breaths taken away from fear and foreboding? Jesus' words were to remind his disciples and us of the message of last week's Christ the King Sunday, that God is working in the world. God is making all things new. That in the face of devastation, whether caused by an impressive empire, natural disasters, or human arrogance, the reign of God will not be impeded. No matter how much is coming undone, God's reign endures. God is over all. But we need to get ready. And that's what Advent is all about. It begins in the dark, said the Episcopal priest Fleming Rutledge, and it is not a season for the faint of heart. For it is about facing the storms and distress around us and nevertheless walking toward Christ in faith and hope. 
Advent invites us to be watchful, to pay attention, and to not be afraid. For God never, ever calls us to fear, except for fear of God's self. In fact, do not be afraid is the voice we most need to hear right now. We are told, be not afraid 103 times in the scripture. Be not afraid, the angel Gabriel told Zechariah in the temple, and then told him that his wife Elizabeth would bear a son. Be not afraid, Gabriel told Mary, in her house on, in Nazareth, announcing then that she would conceive, bear a child, and name him Jesus. Be not afraid, the women who came to the tomb heard when they saw that the stone was rolled away. The voice uttering these words sounds all through our history as the voice of God's messengers, be they saints or angels. It is the voice that proclaims that these strange announcements and signs and portents, these disruptions, are ushering in a new thing, a new time, a time of great light. For light was what God was up to in the Incarnation, to enlighten us to the coming of God's reign, and not one in heaven, not yet at least, but a new earth. So today, when we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, we are affirming God with us. The very word of God coming to pitch its tent among us and dwell with us as one of us. Jesus said in John's Gospel, make your home in me as I make my home in you. And that's why Dutch priest and Henry, writer Henry Nouwen introduced the idea of the house of love, the house of the Lord. The house of love is the house of Christ. In Nouwen's words, the place where we can think, speak, and act in the way of God, not in the way of the fear-filled world. For we are fear-filled. We are afraid of change, and we are afraid of standing still. We are afraid of economic decline. We worry about the costs of our children's education, our health care, our retirement. We're anxious about foreigners, about potential terrorists. We are afraid of people of other faiths. We question their motives, their trustworthiness. We are afraid of disease, Ebola, H1N1, whatever new COVID variant is emerging. We are afraid of what we know and of what we don't know. And so we retreat into the house of fear. Fear taints our outlook and limits our choices. Consequently, our needs for acceptance, affection, influence, and power, and safety determine how we spend our time, our money, and our love. As faithful disciples, we must know where we live, our true address. We must know that we are home, safe, and free. Now and observe that many people live at the wrong address. Although we don't like fear, if we are looking for evidence to support our fear, we will surely find it. And so even though we want to believe in the power of love, we can't quite bring ourselves to leave the house of fear. Now it wasn't long after writing these words in his gospel that Luke was writing the book of Acts of the Apostles. And these act stories provide a stark contrast between the fear and uncertainty before and immediately after the crucifixion. In Acts, after the resurrection, after Pentecost, all that fear had given way, and there was a whole new spirit amongst the followers of the way of Jesus. They had moved into the house of love. Acts describes their relationships as characterized by mutual vulnerability, Gratitude, peace, kindness, and celebration. Like the black church, these first Christians show us what it is to be church, to claim their freedom, to leave the house of fear behind. Their church is indeed a new creation. They live together as stewards of this house of love. Even amidst their persecution, they live joyfully and give cheerfully. So it seems to me that Advent is an invitation to get ourselves ready to move house. It is about attending to the community in which we want love to dwell, but also about attending to our own souls so that they may be a dwelling place for God. So Advent is like a four-week plan to meet, make the needed inspections, to work 
on repairing and shoring up our faith to get ready so we can get on board. The good news is, this is not the first advent, for God has already visited this planet and Jesus. The light is already in the world. We need to reveal it. Advent invites us to create a hospitable place for Jesus' light to shine, where Jesus cannot abide in a house of fear. So in Advent, we are invited to tell the truth, to face life on earth as it is, to name and lament the absence of God, not to descend into denial or polite piety or cheap cheer, to get real and to dwell courageously in the truth. Advent is about stripping away pretense. We are invited to yearn, to get in touch with our holy dissatisfaction and consider what we want for ourselves and for others, to long for a home, to desire God. Advent is about yearning. We are invited to wait. Eugene Peterson called being Christian a long obedience in the same direction. This requires patience in a secular culture that likes a quick fix. We are not striving for perfection. We may not even feel optimistic, but we wait in hope. Advent is about waiting. We are invited to notice, to look at the fig tree, to notice the sprouting leaves, the signs of life and decay both, to notice the movements in our soul and spirit, to watch for the same God who shows up in a teenager's womb in Nazareth might show up anywhere. Advent is about noticing. And we are invited to imagine, to hope creatively, to hope against the grain, to trust that darkness does not come from a different place than light, for both are presided over by the same God. Imagination allows us to face the pressing of the present as the reality of here and now, while holding on to the long view of what could be. Advent is about imagining. Beloveds, where we live determines how we live and how we give. Who we listen to determines what we hear, where we stand determines what we see, and what we do determines who we are. Advent invites us on a pilgrimage to consider these things and to adjust accordingly. And so people will get ready, start walking, start following yonder star. Eventually, you will come upon an unlikely, unlikely dwelling, small, drafty, humbly built, in which the very light of the world became incarnate. You have found yourself in the first, the original, house of love. Welcome home.